Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Open Planetary Lunch Talk, the first of Series 2 in 2021. It's January 19th of 2021. I'm Chase. Our speaker today is Professor Janet Vertesi, who is one of my uh, favorite scholars. I tried to read everything she writes. She wrote, or she edited Whoa. this book, Digital FPS, which I use for reference. You can see by the note there. Um, a book called Seeing Like a Rover. I don't have my copy because I loaned it. And then today we'll be talking about this book that just came out, Shaping Science, Organizations, Decisions, and Culture on NASA Teams. Very excited about today's talk, and I hope you all enjoy it. Janet, when you are ready, uh, just go ahead and take control. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chase. And uh, thank you for that really kind introduction and for uh, plugging the books. And thank you all for being here today. It's really nice to see some familiar names and faces on the line as well. Um, so I'm gonna be speaking about this, uh, this new book that's just come out, uh, Shaping Science, Organizations, Decisions, and Culture on NASA's Teams. And in thinking about how to present this work to this group, I wanna start with the question about what organizations in science are good for, right? I think for scientists, a lot of the time, organizations are uh, like hefty and boring and complicated and impenetrable. Um, their bureaucracy is like antithetical to getting science done. It's a challenge. Uh, you don't want to have to deal with the human stuff. You just kind of want to sit there and get the work done, right? And for a lot of scientists that I've spoken to, um, there was one scientist that I interviewed. Uh, I went to visit him and he was like, well, that's nice you're here, but I'm not going to be doing much science today. I'm just going to be doing bureaucracy, right? And in that kind of statement, there's this sensibility that the bureaucratic or the organizational or any of those like interactional elements of science are separate from the science. Um, and I think we can take a different approach to understanding organizations in science. I think it might be productive instead of thinking of them as the things that get in the way, uh, to think instead about how they're the conduit to our science and not the obstacle. So what if we thought about how organizations, the way that we organize the work in our labs, the way that we interact with each other in our labs, the structures and the cultures of our laboratories and our collaborations, what if we thought about how that was responsible for really shaping our questions, uh, shaping our answers, helping us acquire or work with certain kinds of data sets, and maybe even shaping our career paths. And if we thought about organizations in this much more participatory way in our science, um, that might help us to take some steps towards thinking about how to optimize them for certain kinds of scientific goals or for certain kinds of career collaborative goals. So the purpose of this book really uh, came about when I was uh, interviewing a scientist who'd been on many, many different missions. And he made this statement that every mission is like a living organism. It has a personality and a style. And that personality and style is gained at the beginning of the mission. It never changes. You can change out the people, but you'll still have the same mission personality. Um, and the purpose of the book was really to explore this question analytically to try to understand what it means that scientific collaborations have these kinds of styles and personalities, what it means for the scientists that move through them and work with them and work with each other, and what that means for the science that they end up doing. Um, now, I'm a sociologist of science. And uh, that might need some introduction. So I'm not a journalist who's like looking for a scoop or a psychologist who's gonna put you on the couch and figure out what all the problems are. Um, and I'm not even really a historian who wants to just catalog what happened when and where. Um, although I have worked as a historian in the past. Instead, sociology is interested in the why. Why given a certain set of social arrangements do we see persistently certain kinds of outcomes? Um, is there any regularity to those outcomes? Is there any predictability to those outcomes? Is there anything that we can understand by characterizing and describing the richness of social life that helps us uh, move those insights from one environment to another and potentially help people form better teams and better societies? So um, sociologists in the book, I talk about us as kind of like a space probe ourselves, like we immerse ourselves in the system that is, in my case, the mission team. Uh, we enter into that foreign environment. We have a whole bunch of different methods and tools we can use to make sense of that environment. But ultimately, we're trying to record and then make sense of that social world and present it um, as a thing that has been analyzed and something that, that other people can use. Now, my own work, I'm a sociologist of science and technology in particular. So instead of going to 
some like faraway island and asking, you know, what are the people doing over here? I asked that about scientists. Um, and I'm interested in how the way we interact with each other shapes and determines to a large extent what we might know about the world. Um, this is a statement that was made by Diane Vaughn, who's another sociologist of science and technology who famously studied the Challenger uh, disaster. And she has an extraordinary book called uh, The Challenger Launch Decision that really analyzes in detail what went on there from a sociological point of view. And in a follow-up uh, paper that she published a couple of years later, she asks, like, how do these organizations that you work for shape your own knowledge practices? Because the core thing that she found looking at Challenger was that people weren't being greedy, they weren't, you know, going outside the rules, they were actually acting in accordance with and in alignment with a whole bunch of rules and procedures and organizational structures that were put in place to help manage risk. So this prompted her to ask this question, which I really try to address in the book because I think that understanding how groups shape knowledge is going to be helpful for enabling us to get the right kinds of knowledge in future to try to understand what kinds of knowledge is going to be really robust, what kinds of group organizational forms are going to help us answer certain kinds of questions and so on. So uh, the high level theory of the book, which I'll just give you in one slide here, is a, uh, is a theory of organized science. And that is, I argue, three things. One is that science teams are organizations. And we know a lot about organizations because we've been studying them for a really long time, over 100 years, in fact. Um, and we know that organizations have structures that affect how people interact with each other. We know that organizations divide up labor in a way that um, not only affects the kinds of products that come out and the value that comes out of whatever factory or firm you're studying, um, but that it also shapes the course of the people working in the, co the context of that firm. We also know that they have cultures that really shape the way that people interact with each other and that inform um, your experience as a member of that organization. So the first premise is that we can analyze and we should analyze science teams and collaborations like little mini organizations in the same way that I have colleagues that have walked into, you know, uh, firms on Wall Street or firms in Silicon Valley and using the same kinds of tools or even social movements right and using the same kinds of tools and study what happens in science. What I will present today is an outline of uh, two scientific collaborations and describe those aspects of their organizational structure and culture. And then I'm going to show, as I do in the book, how that structure and culture shapes outcomes. I'm going to focus more on the kind of the ways in which that shapes our knowledge of objects in the world um, and data sets today, but I can be happy to answer questions uh, about any of these properties. So. Um, so what I did is, as an organizational and scientific ethnographer is that I spent uh, two years with one mission team from 2006 to 2008, and then with another mission team from about 2009 to 2012, uh, with some extended interactions after that. Um, and I embedded with these two contrasting missions that took place at the same time. Uh, they actually, their beginning and end dates were within months of each other. So they were basically happening exactly contemporaneously. They often shared personnel. They interacted through the same institutions. Many of the same institutions were involved. Uh, and they're both missions in planetary science, which is, of course, as you know, a pretty interdisciplinary and varied field, um, but largely with a field with its own, you know, journals, its own uh, um, publication norms, et cetera. So it's, it's a field that we could identify in science studies as being a particular style of science. And so what I'm gonna do next is go over some of the work practices and interactions and how decisions are made on the mission I will call Helen. It's traditional to give pseudonyms to the people and even the organizations that you study in organizational sociology. So I'm gonna start with Helen, which is this uh, large uh, flagship mission that flew into the, uh, to the outer planets um, in the early 21st century. Um, it is a, a flyby uh, slash orbiting mission that's moving between different elements and bodies within the Saturn system. Um, and it has about 12 different instruments on board. Um, and it's organized as a flagship mission. So each uh, instrument has its own instrument team. And then I'm gonna to turn to a mission I will call Paris, which is uh, formed under one of the new uh, 
post-discovery class single PI mission structures that NASA introduced in the late 1990s in response to an economic recession. Um, and I'm going to look at what happens with the work practices and interactions and decision making there. Now, Paris is a smaller team than Helen um, by a long shot. Um, it also has a single principal investigator and a single unified science team that were all, some of them selected together and some joined later as, a part as participating scientists. But I'm going to take a quick snapshot of these two different organizations and I go into lots of detail in the book so you're welcome to read it and get all of the details and all of the uh, tidbits there. But then I'm going to uh, give you some snapshots of how this shapes the science these two different teams have done despite the fact that they have so much in common. So. Um, let me begin with the Helen mission, which again is a multi-year orbiting mission to Saturn. Um, the instruments on Helen are all mounted individually. Uh, there was a scan platform that was descoped early on in the mission, and that means that the, the instruments are mounted to the spacecraft body, so wherever the spacecraft points is basically the, the constraining factor on who gets to observe and when. I mentioned that there's 12 instruments, and those, those instruments have their own science teams. But Helen adopted a structure that we know as the matrix organization. Uh, JPL has this structure as well. IBM had it for a really long time. It was a very popular organizational form in the technology industry, largely in the 19, uh, in, in the in the twentieth century. So. Uh, what we do with the matrix team is you might have these individual different units, but you'll matrix them by creating cross cutting working groups where people work on a product or a service altogether. And in this case, what they're all doing is working on a particular aspect of the Saturn system, whether it's the rings or Titan or the moons or something like that. And they're responsible within those groups with of representatives from all these different instrument teams for planning what the spacecraft's going to do when it goes by that target of interest, but also for kind of sharing ideas and science as they go along. Now, the key issue, as I observed it on Helen, is a problem of what they called integration, and which we could probably gloss as a kind of polyvocality. What that means is there are lots and lots of unique voices on Helen. There were at least 350 scientists that I counted, and that was before they did some kind of census, and there's probably more besides. So there's lots of different scientists, and they all have very different science goals and needs. Um, that are largely incommensurate with each other. It's very hard to prioritize among them. And so the, the, the problem was figuring out how to get all those voices together into a feasible plan that the spacecraft could actually execute. And the principle of matrix management is that people in the ranks make those decisions. It's not made by some like senior authority. So on a mission like say Voyager, there, were, there was the circle of PIs who decided everything and rubber stamped everything and decided what was gonna, which observations were gonna be taken and when. On Helen, those decisions are made in the matrix among the scientists themselves. And very rarely do they trickle up to kind of a managerial position, in which case, as I described in the book, there is a way of taking care of that. But I want to direct your attention to this picture here, which is one of the first things I saw when I moved in to watch the Helen mission. Um, and this is a spreadsheet in which they're trying to decide which of multiple different tours the spacecraft should take through the Saturn system. Um, and they have to evaluate these tours for how well those tours uh, meet a scientific objective. And they're supposed to color it in in red, yellow, and green. And you'll notice that there's, there is red, yellow, and green on this spreadsheet, but there's also a lot of lemon lime and there's, there's like pink and there's orange, right? And these colors came about because there, was, there weren't enough colors in red, yellow, and green to really respect and carry forward all the degrees of difference and complexity in the room. And that was an important thing to carry forward. You'll notice there's also numbers in here. Those were put in post hoc because they realized that Excel doesn't tabulate colors. And so they were trying to figure out where their numbers they could put in. And then there was a lot of joking about this as it went on. Um, and Helen is actually a really fun mission to be on because they were constantly, uh, they had these really fun forms of talk that were uh, sort of poking fun at the fact that they were constantly having to fight and negotiate for a space, for very precious spacecraft time, but we're still doing that in an environment where people were deeply, deeply committed to the cause. So people talked about how it's like Congress here, you have to like play the political game of belonging to one group and then belonging to another group. Um, they often uh, aligned instruments names with the names of the people that represented them. So in the meetings in which they were trying to decide what to do, I remember one scientist turning to another and saying, oh, John, you need some time to warm up here. You know, and John was totally fine. The room was warm, but there was he, the instrument needed time and the timeline that had to be accounted for. 
Um, because there's so much uh, difficulty integrating these really polyvocal goals into a single plan, there's an emphasis overall on fairness and fair allocation of resources. Um, as they often said, we can't make everyone happy, but we can make everyone equally unhappy. And this was said, of course, with a tremendous degree of humor and kind of a wry smile. But the, the purpose here is to really point attention to equally which is that it, it had to be clear that people were getting the right number of observations. No one, was, no one was getting more cookies from the observational cookie jar than anybody else. Otherwise, that would really throw the system out of balance. And through it all, they, they talked about working with each other as kind of like being in a family uh, with, you know, you know, when you go to a family picnic, you have your, your crazy uncle, but you love him anyway, right? So there's a sense of like, we've been together a long time. We're working together really hard. We do care a lot about each other, but there are things that we totally disagree about. Uh, the images on the left are spacecraft timelines that are that I discuss in more detail in the book about how they try to reconcile different observational priorities. So that's what's going on in the Helen world and I go into a lot of detail in the book into how they make decisions, how they allocate observations, how each of these different groups works um, and what makes them tick. But I'll just take a quick minute to move over to the other side of the solar system or at least the other side of the asteroid belt. Um, and tell you what's happening at the same time with the Paris mission, which was operating really not too far away down the hallways of many of the people working on Helen. So Paris was a multi-year roving surface-based mission to Mars. It had two robots on different parts of the planet, but they were commanded by the same team. Um, in the book, I characterize Paris as what we would call a charismatic collective. And that is uh, all the scientists belong to the same team. And within that team, they were emphatically collectivized. The purpose was that there were not strong hierarchies between members of the team. And this was astonishing because there were people on this mission that had been, as one person said, well, this person wrote the book on Mars, right? And here I am, a grad student getting to work with them. But because of this kind of collective framing, everyone was supposed to be able to speak up and work together, regardless of if you were a grad student or a postdoc or somebody really senior. And it was a charismatic collective largely because it came together under the guidance or tutelage of this particular PI. And there's lots of different models for how single PIs or leaders might work. Um, in this case, it aligns with what Weber says about uh, charisma, which is really a property of the organization and not necessarily the individual. If you're interested, I'm happy to go into that in questions. So in planning for what this robot was gonna do with its time on its planet, the problem was not polyvocality, it was univocality. It was trying to get everyone to speak with the same voice and ultimately come together around what they called consensus, which was a form of unilateral agreement. And on the team, there was this kind of rule of thumb that whatever everybody agreed to was obviously the right plan and the right thing for the robot and the right thing for the science. Uh, this is very, again, I'm just talking about the cultural and structural environment of Paris. This is what it was like to work there. And what that meant is instead of these planning materials that, you know, separated things out into boxes with different colors, instead they used things like uh, PowerPoint that they write all over image files so that they made sure that they were always seeing the same thing so that you had this kind of singular point of view. And for a long time, they had a webcam trained on the command center uh, that showed the circular table. And the whole purpose of that was, even though many people were called in remotely, was the reminder that we were all around a circular table where we all had to agree. Um, you could, if you needed to, appeal up the chain to the charismatic PI if there were problems. I saw that happen twice in two years. Uh, but largely, the purpose of the team in their daily meetings to command this robot was to come to this agreement among the group. Um, and this happened by at the end of the hour, which was a highly ritualized, uh, very structured meeting for both robots that allowed time and opportunity for people to speak up and say if there were things they needed or things they disagreed with. At the end of the meeting, they'd go around the room and ask everybody if they're happy with the plan. And the response to that, the, we call this a ritual response pair in sociology, the response is, I'm happy. Um, a few times I did hear people say that they were not happy and then they had to sort of go back to the drawing board, but this was uh, such an important form of talk that people even made fun of it. They're like, you know, there was this one group, one role called a tapsy and they'd be like, tapsies, hapsy, right? I mean, this is such a core part of how they closed uh, agreement or signaled agreement that they would use this uh, frequently. 
Um, when I spoke to people involved, they would say that at the end of the meeting, the whole point is that everyone should have ownership over the plan. The robot, as they described it, was a unified entity, just like their team, uh, and that it should be treated more like a Swiss Army knife with lots of different capabilities that anybody could use in order to solve a problem, as opposed to something that was segmented into multiple different instruments with its different teams. Um, and they signaled this kind of unification by using words like we, uh, that, that really placed everybody into the body of the robot, like everyone together, the robot, the scientists, the engineers were all we together. And it made it very hard to draw distinctions between you know, us versus me versus you, mine versus yours, et cetera, because of this really powerful form of talk. Um, I'll just give you a really quick snapshot of two different decision-making moments on the, these two different missions. On the top, there's a picture of an environment where the one scientist really wants the robot to drive and he's put it into false color to show that there's not actually a lot of rocks in the way, so maybe it'd be okay for the robot. And he's drawn this little line to be like, this is a minimal ridge, like surely we can do this. And he's like, I don't know, engineers, have you looked at this way up here? Because we'd really like to go there. And the engineer says, well, we've looked at all the Southern approaches. We don't think they're viable. We don't want to get stuck somewhere we can't recover. Now note already the use of we. Is this we the engineer, we the scientist, we the team, we the robot? It's all of it, right? It's very hard to it's hard to tear that apart and find a, a me or you within that we, right? And I should note that the scientists and engineers working together in harmony and also coming to unilateral agreement was a core feature of the team. So this actually represented a moment of like real difficulty because a scientist and engineer were at odds about what the robot could or couldn't do. And that was a situation they always wanted to avoid. So another scientist spoke up. This is a classic thing you do in consensus-based teams, which is to say, how about this alternative? If we're torn between A and B, let's do C. And everyone rallied around option C and they moved forward. So again, this kind of unilateral consensus, trying to problem solve by bringing everybody together, trying to everybody see the same terrain in the same way, using the word we, et cetera. Um, I also observed a moment, uh, sort of many moments on Helen in which they were trying to, you know, make decisions across these different working groups, uh, as well as within the working groups. And one of my favorite comes from uh, a two hour session where members of the Atmospheres working group and a member of the um, the IC satellites working group basically were sitting together trying to figure out if there was going to be a moment when they could make observations in each other's timelines. Um, and at this point, a rings representative walked by and said in mock jest and surprise, oh my goodness, what are you doing with these guys? They're atmospheres, you know, like you're consulting with the enemy, right? And without skipping a beat, one of these uh, representatives was like, hey, Walter, it's 1940, this is Germany, Karen's Russia, and you're England. We've made a pact to divide up Europe and keep you out, right? So for two hours, I'd been watching these three people go back and forth with a line between them. And now it was like, oh, no, the battle line is, is between us and you right now. We're the United Front and you're not. And of course, there was just like they dissolved into laughter and there were all kinds of jokes about how this didn't really work very well for Germany or Russia and so on. But again, this use of the battle and political metaphors to kind of talk about the difficult, very difficult work that they as a team family had to do to make sure all of these observations could get done and that people's perspective I want to make it clear that um, the, the purpose here is not to say that one group is better than the other. Uh, it's not to say that, uh, you know, one group should be preferred over the other. These were both really exciting and energizing environments to work in at the forefront of planetary exploration. Um, probably anyone you talk to will sort of glow and be effusive about some of the incredible experiences they had on these teams. That said, um, my interest is not in what which one is better, but what they're better at, um, given that they have two such different organizational structures and cultures. They should really be doing, if they're in the same science field, they should be doing the same science. But if they have two different organizational structures and cultures, do we see any differences? And can we characterize those differences? And it turns out, yes, we see differences. And yes, we can characterize them consistent with the organization. So the key finding I talk about in the book, largely I get to in, this, in chapter six, which really talks about how the science that's done by these teams looks really different by virtue of the different organizational structures and cultures they come from. So on the Paris team, this image on the left is from one of the many, many scientific conferences I went to. And here's a, here is a poster that's using lots and lots of different data, even from different spacecraft actually, um, and also from different instruments to try to bring it together and make, a, make some kind of uh, statement about what they're seeing on Mars. 
the image on the right is from a similar conference, uh, but this one is more characteristic of the Helen publications. And here you're seeing a single data set. It's being projected as graphs or being projected as, uh, as an image, right? But it's the same data set just being analyzed in these different ways and by a particular team whose job it was to command that instrument and work with that data. Um, and what this means is that the science actually ends up looking very different because it's come through these different filters. On the one hand, you have this much more kind of synergistic data set where scientists are working together constantly to solve problems. And on the other hand, you have data sets that are relatively, uh, relatively unique and that they're being worked with with their own group of scientists. This was also accompanied by local philosophies of science, which are totally consistent with various different uh, sociological and philosophical studies of science. Uh, on the Paris team, it was that whatever we decide together is what's best for the spacecraft and what's best for the science and what's best for everyone because we've decided it together. And because it's been through that process properly, it's the best thing. Whereas on the other side and on Helen, um, I heard someone once trying to build consensus around an idea and another scientist stood up and was like, I just don't think the process of science is well served if we just get together and say, let's agree not to disagree. You know, science is bold conjecture and refutation. We should be trying to poke holes in each other's arguments. We shouldn't just be lining up together in a row. So those are two very different ideas about how science should be done. It also meant that the data sets uh, circulated and were used in really different ways, which I go into in a lot of detail in the book. These two images are functionally equivalent. They're both uh, a visual image taken by the visual camera in the visual light range. And then overlaid on top is thermal data from the thermal instrument. But the one on the left, uh, which comes from Paris, is like you click a button and you can make these. I mean, they're just all over the place. They were constantly being shown um, because you always wanted to see, you know, the idea was you just always needed to see where the thermal data was on top of like spatial location, like obviously. The one on the right uh, took several months to put together and was really a kind of unique data product by the time it was released um, and was subject to a lot of what uh, scientists called a major political issues associated with coordinating observations. And I can go into more detail about those, but it wasn't that people were like mean or terrible. It was just that trying to figure out how to get the spacecraft to look at similar things at the same time, or how to transfer the data from one location to another and co-register it, or which calibration algorithms to use, that those kinds of things were much more contested uh, in the space where the organization was sort of divided up into these groups and they were in the organization where it was all obviously unified. And in the organization where it was unified, people said, well, don't ever limit yourself to one instrument. That would be foolish, right? What was really interesting for me by examining this um, was a conversation with a scientist who said, you know, what's interesting working with both of these data sets is that the Paris one is really good at breadth. Like if you have this one rock you want to look at and you want to see it in all the ways, you can do that. But if you want to find every rock in a region that has a certain set of spectral characteristics, that's going to be harder to do. It's going to depend on where the team situationally in the moment made built consensus around particular rocks. It's not going to be comprehensive. And I, in the book, I talk about moments where people tried to go against that grain and what happened in those cases. Meanwhile, of course, uh, among the Hellenites, Helen data is brilliant at uh, in-depth observations of objects over time because you can just come back and keep looking for it. If you, if you can argue for that time on the spacecraft, you can just get that data. But integrating the findings takes longer, it's harder, and it usually happens as a second order. Um, I will very quickly make a note that the classic argument I hear from planetary scientists is that the reason why these missions are so different is because one is an orbiter and one is a, a rover. And so that's obviously why. Uh, if you're at a rover, you can take your time. Uh, you can take your time to build consensus. Uh, you're, you're not whipping around at like, you know, hundreds of thousands of kilometers an hour. And that's the case if you're on some kind of orbiter or flyby mission team. Um, and actually, I was suspicious of that already from the beginning, because my experience on Paris was that you were always worried that the robots were going to die um, any day, and you were always worried that you had no time to do the science you wanted to do. Whereas I moved over to, when I moved to Helen, they were busy planning the death of their spacecraft and making jokes about it because it was going to be this great fiery demise, and that was going to be brilliant, and they're joking about it in much the same way that they, they do about Congress, right? So, uh, so I was suspicious of that. And then of course, since doing this study, we've seen spacecraft that are rovers uh, 
fly with a Helen organizational form. And we've seen spacecraft that are orbiters or flyby missions fly with a Paris organizational form. And the findings are more consistent with the organization than they are with the body of the spacecraft. In fact, I even found, and these are some of the images here that I talk about in more detail in the book, that people embodied or came to get a really powerful sense of the possibilities of their spacecraft in a way that was limited or, or con was a, a conduit uh, through these different organizational forms. So in one, uh, in one scenario, people physically embodied the robot, uh, brought the robot's experience into their body. In the other, people use their hand in the right hand rule like some kind of uh, calculator, twisting it around to figure out as far from their bodies as possible to be able to see all of its not only technical capabilities, but which instruments would be able to observe and when. Um, and another uh, provocative finding is that we often think that the, the collaboration and strength of the collaboration depends on the people in it. What I found is actually that the people were shaped by the collaboration. And I found that people behaved in ways that were largely consistent with the organization and its organizational form. Um, here's a, a quote from a scientist who was on both missions who talked about how differently he acted uh, when he was in one scenario versus the other. And I want you to notice also when he talks about this, he code switches very easily between the Paris way of talking and the Helen way of talking, right? The kind of uh, ownership over the plan, gentility, uh, and happiness form of talk to the Congress and battlefields form of talk. Walking into a situation on Helen, being wary of the fact there are loaded guns all over the place that people are anxious to fire. In a Helen meeting, I would never walk in with a, without both guns out of my sword. In a Paris meeting, I would leave them in my hotel. I'd be totally stunned if there were a confrontation that was not an honest argument that we could debate. So note that code switch in his language, right? Um, and I also noted following scientists like this person that they changed the way that they interacted with each other based on which group they were in. Um, this is a thing that humans do. We are very good at reading the interactional forms of the room, right, and the different cultures that we're in, so we shouldn't be surprised. Um, this chapter also goes into some detail, though, about the career uh, um, outcomes of people within these organizations. We know, for instance, that women and minorities tend to do better in bureaucratic organizations that would look more like Helen than they do in flatter organizations that would look more like Paris. Um, and I go into a lot of detail here about what happens to the various men and women in their careers as they move through these different organizational forms. And one of the things I describe is that there are very strong friendship networks in planetary science, which you've probably observed yourself, um, where there's a certain form of self-presentation and personal style that is shared among members of that group. And what those group members do is buffer each other in their careers and help each other in their careers within the general structure of planetary science. So if you're interested, chapter nine. And I'll just... Uh, come to a conclusion soon by showing you this is a slide of the um, co-publication matrices for both teams. And again, this is astonishing as a sociologist because we would expect, the sociology of science expects relative regularity within a field um, for the way that it publishes. We often download like all of chemistry from Web of Science and we sort of depict it and figure out what the co-publication matrices are and how people are citing each other and so on. But these are just the publications from, um, on the left is Paris and on the right is Helen. And what you can see, this is these were uh, detected, cluster detected by the computer. On the left, you notice that it's a highly dense interconnected network. Every, every ball is, an, is a node, is an individual author. And every tie is, a, um, is that they've actually they've published together a certain number of times. Um, the one on the left is I think 10 times and the one on the right is I think 15 times. Um, but I've done these at many different sort of degrees and it generally holds. The one on the left also, there's different size bubbles and that's trying to show you which, which node is the most central and centrality is actually shared between three nodes. So it isn't even the PI who's most central. It's the PI and two other members of the team that are responsible for sort of bringing everybody together. And there's not a lot of difference detected in clusters of different kinds of scientists because they're constantly working together. And the nearest neighbor path here, like the, the pathway from one person to another is just a little over one. So almost everybody is connected to each other. On the right, though, you see something that's much more consistent with the other flagship missions that I've, I've graphed in a similar way, and that is that the computer instantly detects the clusters that are the instrument teams. Um, and what you even see here is an even further distinction where down in the bottom right are all the physics instruments, which actually tended to publish together more like Paris. Actually, they were like a mini Paris light on Helen, um, as opposed to the other instruments that did uh, visual and other, other forms of analysis. 
And we can also see change over time. So the, on the one hand, this looks a lot like the Galileo diagram and a lot like the Voyager diagram. These are very similar for flagship forms. But you'll notice a couple of nodes in the middle that are holding the whole network together, that are bridging nodes. Those nodes only appeared quite late in the organization as they had a new project scientist who wanted to encourage collaboration between the different groups um, and got them to like sign data sharing agreements and so on in order to investigate the Aurora. So that actually created bridge nodes between different groups that were otherwise distinct when I ran this uh, analysis before. So I think there's some important implications here for scientific teams. Um, and again, my purpose in writing this book is not to uh, expose any, you know, like this is really how the sausage is made, et cetera, at NASA. The purpose of going through this in such detail is to really, really catalog and characterize what makes these teams different and also how those differences play out in the kinds of science that they do, the kinds of career paths that we see, the kinds of publications and data that we see emerge from these missions. And if it's true that the organization you're in shapes the kinds of questions you ask, the data you collect and the science that you do, maybe we could turn those questions around and start thinking strategically, right? Instead of having the organization in the way of our goals, what kinds of organizations do we need in order to fulfill those goals? Can we think strategically about how to leverage the best of each of these different organizations to achieve what we need to do as a science school? So I've been working recently with the Europa Clipper mission, which has synergized requirements in their level one science schools. And what they've needed to do is bring in a lot more practices that look like Paris, despite the fact that they have other heritage uh, uh, members and team members, et cetera, that come from Helen. Meanwhile, I've been also been working with the interstellar probe team um, and because they need to go for a very, very long time before they get to even where they're going to start taking data, I've been like, you actually have to use the Helen form because that's the form that's going to be the most stable for the longest period of time. So there's a different organizational form that will achieve different science goals. And I think if we can align those more, more um, thoughtfully, we'll have less of the experience of the organization being in the way. We might even start thinking about moving back and forth or sequencing between these different styles of mission instead of the kind of fly, rove, land, whatever, sequence, fly, land, rove, sequence, return samples. We could think instead about these kind of like big views, synergistic view, encyclopedic views, synergistic views that allow us to get a much more robust and multi-sided view of the planets that we're studying. And then it's also worth noting that these are the petri dishes that encourage the next generation of collaborations among scientists who are learning how to collaborate and whose careers are being inexorably shaped by their participation in these different teams. So uh, another prompt in this book is how we might leverage the social science insights around teaming to really encourage the success of the next generation of planetary scientists. So I will stop there and thank you very much for your attention and your patience. And I'm really delighted to answer any questions you might have. Thanks.